friends, welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager of the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for day 12 of our read along together of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. We just have six more days of reading. <laughs> and so um, this is an exciting day. Um, let's go ahead and start out with some tea. My tea that I'm drinking is actually not a hot tea today. It's just because I brewed a pot earlier and I didn't manage to finish it. So I'm finishing it now. This one is a coca leaf mint tea which I actually picked up years ago when I was in Peru. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I had this, a couple of tea bags left in my box, finished it off today. This is the last of my coca tea. Hello. Mm, still good, still minty. Um, and let's see. So we had one chapter only that we read on Thursday. As usual, it was a good chapter. <laughs> <laughs> the chapter we read on Thursday. Thursday feels so long ago. So let's look back together and remember what we read last week. On Thursday, um, so the previous day, we had started out with um, Edgar, sorry, Edgar Linton had brought back his nephew, Linton Heathcliff. Again, Emily Bronte, great writer, not super creative with her names, loves repeating the names. Hello! Um, and so, Edgar Linton had brought back his nephew, Linton Heathcliff, and his daughter, Kathy, who is the daughter also of Kathy slash Catherine Earnshaw, Earnshaw Linton, you know, his daughter was quite, was going to be disappointed to learn that her, her cousin had been reclaimed by his father, Mr. Heathcliff, and was now going to be taken away from their home at Thrushcross Grange. So where chapter one, chapter 21 started was Kathy waking up excited to see her cousin again because he'd just come last night to Thrushcross Grange, and then learning that her cousin's father, so I guess in some way her uncle, um, had, yeah, her uncle, had um, taken back his son. And she was not told where her, her, her new cousin was living. She didn't realize that he lived just over the hill on the next estate of Wuthering Heights um, because basically her father hates Mr. Heathcliff and didn't want the families to have anything to do with each other. And so years go by, um, uh, years go by and like, you know, Nellie Dean learns a little here and there about um, about the residents across the way, about you know Edgar Lin or sorry Little Linton Heathcliff um, being a bit sickly still. Um, time goes on. Kathy is now sixteen. My meanwhile, her cousin Linton is I think six months younger than she is. Is what is the thing? Um, so little Kathy Linton um, turns sixteen on the twentieth of March, and this is also what would normally seem to be a wonderful day because it's her birthday but it's also the commemoration of the day when her mother died because again, um, her mother lived only two years after the birth of the daughter, or sorry, two hours after the birth of the daughter. Um, and so because Edgar Linton is still mourning the death of his wife, they don't celebrate the birthday of his daughter. And so instead he spends the day pretty much in solitude and you know, going over to the kirkyard and like, you know, at her, his wife's grave. And so Kathy, slash Catherine Linton is pretty much alone on her birthday. And so she goes exploring a little bit. She goes exploring with Nellie Dean and Nellie tries to keep up with her, but she gets further and further away until finally she is met on the grounds belonging to Mr. Heathcliff. And Mr. Heathcliff says, well, who are you? And she's like, well, you must know who I am. You must know who my father is, you know, because she's, she's a nice girl, but she's a little full of herself because why wouldn't she be? She's always been indulged by her father and all the servants on the estate. And she's like, well, you must know my father. You know, everyone knows my father. And Heathcliff, of course, does know and hate her father. And so he doesn't, you know, he isn't quite nice right away. But then he's like, you know, you, you're probably gonna be tired. You should probably come back to my place. And Nellie's like, no, do not go back to his place. And she's like, oh, I think that sounds like a good idea. I want to go back to your place. All of these characters are warned repeatedly not to do the things that they do that will later bring them trouble. But again, that's the beauty of Wuthering Heights. They always do it. They always go for the thing that they're warned not to do. So Kathy is told very strenuously, don't go. She goes to Wuthering Heights. And when she gets there, you know, she is. She was um, met by the way by Heathcliff with, his, with Hareton. And um, they end up going back and Kathy says, well, or sorry, Mr. Heathcliff says, do you know my son? And she's like, no, I don't know him. And he's like, look closer. Do you not remember him? I mean, like, do you not remember Linton? And then she's like, Linton, like I hadn't seen him in years. I mean, she had just seen him for like a few brief hours the night when he arrived at Thrushcross Grange before his father claimed him back the next morning. Um, 
or took him back the next morning. And so she's like, oh, so you must be my uncle. And it's kind of funny. She says, I thought I liked you, though you were cross at first. <laughs> it's like, why don't you come visit us? You live so close. All these years you could have been by. It's like, yeah, your father doesn't actually like me. And so um, it goes on. And um, he basically says, you know, he didn't like me because I was. he thought I was too poor to marry his sister. And so, you know, he's always his pride has always been touched by that. And so that's why we're not friendly. It's a little more than that, but... Um, and, she, and so where what ends up happening is that little Kathy slash Catherine, I still get confused as to whether to call her Kathy or Catherine, um, young Miss Catherine um, is talking with her cousin Linton and the two of them are talking on their own and Nellie basically says, you know, I don't, she's, you know, she and Heathcliff are having a side conversation. She's like, I don't like this. I don't like what you're doing. And he basically is very forthright with Nellie. He's very straightforward about what he wants. And he says, um, you know, what I want, um, let's see, he, he says basically that, you know, he doesn't, he wants the two, the, the two young ones to get to know each other. Ultimately, he wants the two of them to marry each other, um, to fall in love with each other, and that's what he wants. He, I mean, he tells Nellie straight up, um, and he says, and also, I want it to happen soon because he's, you know, he doesn't esteem his own son very much. You know, like if they get to know each other too well, she will discover his value and send him to the devil. So basically, when she really gets to know him, she won't want him. But right now, she doesn't know him that well, so yeah, she could fall in love with him. You know, um, and he also says too. Now, if it'd been Hareton. And he says basically that if Hareton had not been the child of Hindley, his old childhood tormentor, that he would love Hareton, that Hareton is more common with him in spirit and, you know, and in, and in attitude and everything. It just, he, I'd have loved the lad had he been someone else. And so even though Hareton is also a cousin of Kathy's, he thinks that, you know, because Linton seems so much more refined and um, that Hareton is so coarse that she will choose Linton instead of Hareton. And um, let's see, I think there's another way he phrases it in there too, basically something like how, let's see if I can find the actual phrasing, but it was something along the lines of how Linton seems so good and Hareton actually is good. And he's hoping that he can kind of get her to pick the one that seems good. Um, let's see if I can find it. <laughs> ah, here we go. There it is. He's comparing his own son, his flesh and blood son of Linton, with Hareton, who is sort of, he's raised, and who Hareton looks up to Heathcliff much more than he did his own father of Henley. Um, but at the same time, even though Heathcliff loves loves Hareton despite himself, he also hates him still because he is a child of Henley. And he says, there is this difference. One is gold put to the use of paving stones, and the other is tin polished to ape a service of silver. Mine has nothing valuable about it, yet I shall have the merit of making it go as far as such poor stuff can go. His, meaning Henley's son of Hareton, had first-rate qualities, and they are lost, rendered worse than unavailing. So his revenge on Hindley is to basically destroy his son of Hareton um, in the same way that Hindley tried to hurt Heathcliff and make him degraded before Kathy. Um, so it's interesting. Um, Heathcliff, he has this very direct and forthright conversation with Nellie, admitting clearly what he wants to do um, to set up the two young ones and to have her dislike Hareton. Um, meanwhile, Hareton and young Catherine go out to look at something and then Linton goes and follows. And in the course of the conversation the three have, Hareton reveals that he doesn't know how to read. And Linton mocks Hareton. And it's interesting because Kathy and Linton both laugh together at Hareton. It's not very nice. Um, and it's one of those things that Nellie, she says, as she observes like the meanness of Linton, the mean spiritedness, she feels less pity and sympathy for him. And she begins to kind of, you know, just shrink, like to not like him as much as she had. Uh, been inclined to do, and and yet Kathy doesn't see that. Cat, young Kathy doesn't see that Linton is hollow inside, and so she just finds the humor in the situation rather than the cruelty. And so um, eventually, 
Nellie is able to draw young Kathy away and bring her back to Thrushcross Grange. And she's like, don't say anything. And even Heathcliff says, I don't think you should say anything to your father. You can still come visit, but don't say anything to your dad. He really won't like this. So of course she goes home. She tells her dad, oh, daddy, guess what I did? You're not going to know what I did. I saw, you know, I saw Hareton, or I saw Linton and Mr. Heathcliff. And it's like, she just tells it right out. And Mr. Linton tries to convince her about the terribleness of Mr. Heathcliff, about his um, deception and his um, cruelty, and that he will ultimately try to hurt the family. And so that's why he's trying to protect the family by having her not go there. And Kathy seems to go along with it, but then that night when she's ready to go to bed, she cries to, Kat, to Nellie Dean. She says like, oh, he's expecting me to go visit him tomorrow. I said I'd go, can't I at least write him a letter? And she's like, no, if you write him a letter, that's gonna be the start of many letters. Do not do that, do not go down this path. I, do I need to even say what happens? Kathy goes down that path. She goes running down that path. And so a while later, Nellie realizes that Kathy seems to have some secret, something hidden in a drawer. She goes one day and she opens a drawer and she finds a collection of love letters from young Linton. They're kind of weird letters because they, they start out kind of natural, then they have things that don't seem like they're his. So, I mean, I don't know if the implication is that Heathcliff is helping to write it, if he's feeding the words, what's going on, but they're not genuine. And then um, the next morning, she's, she intercepts a, a little letter that Kathy has given to the milk boy to deliver to Wuthering Heights, and then he's going to bring back another note. Um, and so she's able to see the note too, and she says, wow, oh, Kathy is a much better writer <laughs> than young Linton seems to be. And so Nellie reveals to Kathy that she has read those letters and that she needs her to stop, that it's wrong, that she is lying, and that if she doesn't put a stop to it, that if Kathy won't stop of her own, that Nellie will put a stop to it by revealing all to her father. And so she ends up burning all the letters and writing back to the, um, to the carrying, giving the little boy a note saying, Master Heathcliff is requested to send no more notes to Miss Linton as she will not receive them. And then from there forward, the little boy came with no notes hidden in his pocket. So that was an exciting cliffhanger we ended with last week. Um, today we have two chapters, chapters 22 and 23. Let's see what happens today in Wuthering Heights. Will they continue to make bad decisions? Probably. Will they, will there be true love and happiness? Ultimately, you, you really hope there has to be a happy ending in this somewhere, right? Right? Maybe in chapter 22, maybe in chapter 23? Let's find out. Chapters 22 and 23 of Wuthering Heights. Chapter 22. Summer drew to an end and early autumn. It was past Michaelmas. But the harvest was late that year and a few of our fields were still uncleared. Mr. Linton and his daughter would frequently walk out among the reapers. At the carrying of the last sheaves, they stayed till dusk, and the evening happening to be chill and damp, my master caught a bad cold that, settling obstinately on his lungs, confined him, confined him indoors throughout the whole of the winter, nearly without intermission. Poor Kathy, frightened from her little romance, had been considerably sadder and duller since its abandonment, and her father insisted on her reading less and taking more exercise. She had his companionship no longer. I esteemed it a duty to supply its lack, as much as possible, with mine, an inefficient substitute, for I could only spare two or three hours from my numerous diurnal occupations to follow her footsteps, and then my society was obviously less desirable than his. On an afternoon in October, or the beginning of November, a fresh watery afternoon, when the turf and paths were rustling with moist withered leaves, and the cold blue sky was half hidden by clouds, dark gray streamers rapidly mounting from the west and boding abundant rain, I requested my young lady to forego her ramble because I was certain of showers. She refused, and I unwillingly donned a cloak and took my umbrella to accompany her on a stroll to the bottom of the park a formal walk which she generally affected if low-spirited, and that she invariably was when Mr. Edgar had been worse than ordinary, a thing never known from his confession, but guessed both by her and me from his increased silence and the melancholy of his countenance. She went sadly on. There was no running or bounding now, though the chill wind might well have tempted her to a race. And often, from the side of my eye, I could detect her raising a hand and brushing something off her cheek. I gazed round for a means of diverting her thoughts. On one side of the road rose a high, rough bank where hazels and stunted oaks, with their roots half exposed, held uncertain tenure. The soil was too loose for the latter, and strong winds had blown some nearly horizontal. 
In summer, Miss Catherine delighted to climb along these trunks and sit in the branches, swinging 20 feet above the ground. And I, pleased with her agility and her light childish heart, still considered it proper to scold every time I caught her at such an elevation, but so that she knew there was no necessity for descending. From dinner to tea, she would lie in her breeze-rocked cradle, doing nothing except singing old songs, my nursery lore, to herself, or watching the birds, joint tenants, feed and entice their young ones to fly, or nestling with closed lids, half thinking, half dreaming, happier than words can express. Look, miss, I exclaimed, pointing to a nook under the roots, roots of one twisted tree. Winter is not here yet. There is a little flower up yonder, the last bud from the multitude of bluebells that clouded those turf steps in July with a lilac mist. Will you clamber up and pluck it to show to Papa? Kathy stared a long time at the lonely blossom trembling in its earthly shelter and replied at length, No, I'll not touch it. But it looks melancholy, does it not, Ellen? Yes, I observed, about as starved and sackless as you. Your, your cheeks are bloodless. Let us take hold of hands and run. You're so low, I dare say I shall keep up with you. No, she repeated and continued sauntering on, pausing at intervals to muse over a bit of moss or a tuft of blanched grass or a fungus spreading its bright orange among the heaps of brown foliage. And ever and anon, her hand was lifted to her averted face. Catherine, why are you crying, love? I asked, approaching and put, putting my arm over her shoulder. You mustn't cry because Papa has a cold. Be thankful it is nothing worse. She now put no further restraint on her tears. Her breath was stifled by sobs. Oh, it will be something worse she said, and what shall I do when Papa and you leave me, and I am by myself? I can't forget your words, Ellen. They are always in my ear. How life will be changed, how dreary the world will be when Papa and you are dead. None can tell whether you won't die before us, I replied. It's wrong to anticipate evil. We'll hope there are years and years to come before any of us must go. Master is young, and I am strong, and hardly forty-five. My mother lived till eighty, a canty dame to the last. And suppose Mr. Linton were spared till he saw sixty. That would be more years than you have counted, miss. And would it not be foolish to mourn a calamity above twenty years beforehand? But Aunt Isabella was younger than Papa, she remarked, gazing up with timid hope to seek further consolation. Aunt Isabella had not you and me to nurse her, I replied. She wasn't as happy as Master. She hadn't as much to live for. All you need do is to wait well on your father and cheer him by letting him see you cheerful and avoid giving him anxiety on any subject. Mind that, Kathy. I'll not disguise, but you might kill him if you were wild and reckless and cherished a foolish, fanciful affection for the son of a person who would be glad to have him in his grave and allowed him to, to discover that you fretted over the separation he has judged it expedient to make? I fret about nothing on earth except Papa's illness, answered my companion. I care for nothing in comparison with Papa, and I'll never, never, oh, never while I have my senses, do and act or say a word to vex him. I love him better than myself, Ellen, and I know it by this. I pray every night that I may live after him because I would rather be miserable than that he should be. That proves I love him better than myself. Good words, I replied, but deeds must prove it also. And after he is well, remember you don't forget resolutions formed in the hour of fear. As we talked, we, yeah, as we talked, we neared a door that opened on the road and my young lady, lightning into sunshine again, climbed up and seated herself on the top of the wall, reaching over to gather some hips that bloomed scarlet on the summit branches of the wild rose trees, shadowing the highway side. The lower fruit had disappeared, but only birds could touch the upper, except from Kathy's present station. In stretching to pull them, her hat fell off, and as the door was locked, she proposed scrambling down to recover it. I bid her be cautious lest she got a fall, and she nimbly disappeared. But the return was no such easy matter. 
The stones were smooth and neatly cemented, and the rose bushes and blackberry stragglers could yield no assistance in reascending. I, like a fool, didn't recollect that till I, till I heard her laughing and exclaiming, Ellen, you'll have to fetch the key, or else I must run round to the porter's lodge. I can't scale the ramparts on this side. Stay where you are, I answered. I have my bundle of keys in my pocket. Perhaps I may manage to open it. If not, I'll go. Catherine amused herself with dancing to and fro before the door while I tried all the large keys in succession. I had applied the last and found that none would do. So repeating my desire that she, would, that she would remain there, I was about to hurry home as fast as I could when an approaching sound arrested me. It was the trot of a horse. Kathy's dance stopped, and in a minute the horse stopped also. Who is that? I whispered. Ellen, I wish you could open the door, whispered back my companion, anxiously. Ho, Miss Linton, cried a deep voice, the riders. I'm glad to meet you. Don't be in haste to enter, for I have an explanation to ask and obtain. I shan't speak to you, Mr. Heathcliff, answered Catherine. Papa says you are a wicked man, and you hate both him and me, and Ellen says the same. That is nothing to the purpose, said Heathcliff. He it was. I don't hate my son, I suppose, and it is concerning him that I demand your attention. Yes, you have cause to blush. Two or three months since, were you not in the habit of writing to Linton, making love and play, eh? You deserved, both of you, flogging for that. You especially, the elder and less sensitive, as it turns out. I've got your letters, and if you give me any pertness, I'll send them to your father. I presume you grew weary of the amusement and dropped it, didn't you? Well, you dropped Linton with it into a slough of despond. He was in earnest in love really as true as i live he's dying for you breaking his heart at your fickleness not figuratively but actually though hareton has made him a standing jest for six weeks and i have used more serious measures and attempted to frighten him out of his idiocy he gets worse daily and he'll be under the sod before summer unless you restore him how can you lie so glaringly to the poor child i called from the inside Pray, write on. How can you deliberately get up such paltry falsehoods? Miss Cathy, I'll knock the lock off with a stone. You won't believe that vile nonsense. You can feel in yourself. It is impossible that a person should die for the love of a stranger. I was not aware there were eavesdroppers, muttered the detected villain. Worthy Mrs. Dean, I like you, but I don't like your double dealing, he added aloud. How could you lie so glaringly as to affirm I hated the poor child and invent bugbear stories to terrify her from my doorstones? Catherine Linton, the very name warms me. My bonny lass, I shall be, home, be from home all this week. Go and see if I have not spoken truth. Do, there is a darling. Just imagine your father in my place and Linton in yours. Then, then think how you would value your careless lover if he refused to stir a step to comfort you when your father himself entreated him. And don't, from pure stupidity, fall into the same error. I swear on my salvation, he's going to his grave, and none but you can save him. The lock gave way, and I issued out. I swear Linton is dying, repeated Heathcliff, looking hard at me and grief and disappointment are hastening his death. Nellie, if you won't let her go, you can walk over yourself, but I shall not return till this time next week, and I think your master himself would scarcely object to her visiting her cousin. Come in, said I, taking Kathy by the arm and half forcing her to re-enter, for she lingered, viewing with troubled eyes the features of the speaker, too stern to express his inward deceit. He pushed his horse, his horse close and bending down observed, Miss Catherine, I'll own to you that I have little patience with Linton and Hareton and Joseph have less. I'll own that he's with a harsh set. He pines for kindness as well as love and a kind word from you would be his best medicine. Don't mind Mrs. Dean's cruel cautions, but be generous and contrive to see him. He dreams of you day and night and cannot be persuaded that you don't hate him since you neither write nor call. 
I closed the door and rolled a stone to assist the loosened lock in holding it, and spreading my umbrella, I drew my charge underneath, for the rain began to drive through the moaning branches of the trees and warned us to avoid delay. Our hurry prevented any comment on the encounter with Heathcliff as we stretched towards home, but I divined instinctively that Catherine's heart was clouded now in double darkness. Her features were so sad and they did not seem hers. She evidently regarded what she had heard as every syllable true. The master had retired to rest before we came in. Kathy stole to his room to inquire how he was. He had fallen asleep. She returned and asked me to sit with her in the library. We took our tea together and afterwards she laid down on the rug and told me not to talk for she was weary. I got a book and pretended to read. As soon as she was supposed me absorbed in my occupation, she recommenced her silent weeping. It appeared at present her favorite diversion. I suffered her to enjoy it a while, then I expostulated, deriding and ridiculing all Mr. Heathcliff's assertions about his son as if I were certain she would coincide. Alas, I hadn't the skill to counteract the effect his account has produced. It was just what he intended. You may be right, Ellen, she answered, but I shall never feel at ease till I know. And I must tell Linton it is not my fault that I don't write and convince him that I shall not change. What use were anger and protestations against her silly credulity? We parted that night, hostile, but next day beheld me on the road to Wuthering Heights by the side of my willful young mistress's pony. I couldn't bear to witness her sorrow, to see her pale, dejected countenance and heavy eyes, and I yielded in the faint hope that Linton himself might prove, by his reception of us, how little of the tale was founded on fact. Chapter 23. The rainy night had ushered in a misty morning, half frost, half drizzle, and temporary, and temporary brooks crossed our path, gurgling from the uplands. My feet were thoroughly wetted. I was cross and low, exactly the humor suited for making the most of these disagreeable things. We entered the farmhouse by the kitchen way to ascertain whether Mr. Heathcliff were really absent because I put slight faith in his own affirmations. Joseph seemed sitting in a sort of Elysium alone beside a roaring fire, a quart of ale on the table near him bristling with large pieces of toasted oat cake and his black short pipe in his mouth. Catherine ran to the hearth to warm herself. I asked if the master was in. My question remained so long unanswered that I thought the old man had grown deaf and repeated it louder. Nay, he snarled, or rather screamed through his nose. Nay, you, you must go back where, where you come from. Joseph, cried a peevish, peevish voice simultaneously with me from the inner room. How often am I to call you? There are only a few red ashes now. Joseph, come this moment. Vigorous puffs and a resolute stare into the grate declared he had no ear for this appeal. The housekeeper and Hareton were invisible, one gone on an errand and the other at his work, probably. We knew Linton's tones and entered. Oh, I hope you'll die in a garret, starve to death, said the boy, mistaking our approach for that of his negligent attendant. He stopped on observing his error, his cousin flew to him. Is that you, Miss Linton? He said, raising his head from the arm of the great chair in which he reclined. No, don't kiss me. It takes my breath. Dear me. Papa said you would call, continued he, after recovering a little from Catherine's embrace, while she stood by looking very contrite. Will you shut the door, if you please? You left it open, and those... Those detestable creatures won't bring coals to the fire. It's so cold. I stirred up the cinders and fetched a scuttle full myself. The invalid complained of being covered with ashes, but he had a tiresome cough and looked feverish and ill, so I did not rebuke his temper. Well, Linton, murmured Catherine, when his corrugated brow relaxed. Are you glad to see me? Can I do you any good? Why didn't you come before, he said. You should have come instead of writing. It tired me dreadfully writing those long letters. I'd far rather have talked to you. Now I can neither bear to talk nor anything else. I wonder where Zilla is. Will you, looking at me, step into the kitchen and see? 
I had received no thanks for my other service, and being unwilling to run to and fro at his behest, I replied, Nobody is out there but Joseph. I want to drink, he exclaimed fretfully, turning away. Zola is constantly getting off to Gimmerton since Papa went. It's miserable, and I'm obliged to come down here. They resolved never to hear me upstairs. Is your father attentive to you, Master Heathcliff? I asked, perceiving Catherine to be checked in her friendly advances. Attentive? He makes them a little more attentive at least, he cried. The wretches. Do you know, Miss Linton, that brute Hareton laughs at me? I hate him. Indeed, I hate them all. They are odious beings. Kathy began searching for some water. She lighted on a pitcher in the dresser, filled a tumbler, and brought it. He bid her add a spoonful of wine from a bottle on the table, and having swallowed a small portion, appeared more tranquil, and, then she, and said she was very kind. And are you glad to see me? asked she, reiterating her former question and pleased to detect the faint dawn of a smile. Yes, I am. It's something new to hear a voice like yours, he replied. But I have been vexed because you wouldn't come, and Papa swore it was owing to me. He called me a pitiful, shuffling, worthless, worthless thing and said you despised me. And if he had been in my place, he would be more the master of the Grange than your father by this time. But you don't despise me, do you, miss? I wish you would say Catherine or Kathy, interrupted my young lady. Despise you? No. Next to Papa and Ellen, I love you better than anybody living. I don't love Mr. Heathcliff, though, and I dare not come when he returns. Will he stay away many days? Not many, answered Linton, but he goes on to the moors frequently since the shooting season commenced, and you might spend an hour or two with me in his absence. Do say you will. I think I should not be peevish with you. You'd not provoke me, and you'd be always ready to help me, wouldn't you? Yes, said Catherine, stroking his long, soft hair. If I could only get Papa's consent, I'd spend half my time with you. Pretty Linton, I wish you were my brother. And then you would like me as well as your father, observed he more cheerfully. But Papa says you would love me better than him and all the world if you were my wife. So I'd rather you were that. No, I should never love anybody better than Papa, she returned gravely. And people hate their wives sometimes, but not their sisters and brothers. And if you were the latter, you would live with us, and Papa would be as fond of you as he is of me. Linton denied that people ever hated their wives, but Kathy affirmed they did, and, in her wisdom, instanced her own father's aversion to her aunt. I endeavored to stop her, excuse me, instanced his own father's aversion to her aunt. I endeavored to stop her thoughtless tongue. I couldn't succeed till everything she knew was out. Master Heathcliff, much irritated, asserted her relation was false. Papa told me, and Papa does not tell falsehoods. Oh, sorry, sorry. Papa told me, and Papa does not tell falsehoods, she answered pertly. My Papa scorns yours, cried Linton. He calls him a sneaking fool. Yours is a wicked fool, or excuse me, a wicked man, retorted Catherine, and you are very naughty to dare to repeat what he says. He must be wicked to have made Aunt Isabella leave him as she did. She didn't leave him, said the boy. You shan't contradict me. She did, cried my young lady. Well, I'll tell you something, said Linton. Your mother hated your father. Now then. Oh, exclaimed Catherine, too enraged to continue. And she loved mine, added he. You little liar. I hate you now, she panted, and her face grew red with passion. She did, she did, sang Linton, sinking into the recess of his chair and leaning back his head to enjoy the agitation of the other disputant who stood behind. Hush, Master Heathcliff, I said. That's your father's tale too, I suppose. It isn't. You hold your tongue, he answered. She did, she did, Catherine. She did, she did. Kathy, beside herself, gave the chair a violent push and caused him to fall against one arm. He was immediately seized by a suffocating cough that soon ended his triumph. It, laughed, it lasted so long that it frightened even me. As to his cousin, she wept with all her might, aghast at the mischief she had done, though she said nothing. 
I held him till the fit exhausted itself. Then he thrust me away and leant his head down silently. Catherine quelled her lamentations also, took a seat opposite, and looked solemnly into the fire. How do you feel now, Master Heathcliff? I inquired after waiting ten minutes. I wish she felt as I do, he replied. Spiteful, cruel thing. Hareton never touches me. He never struck me in his life. And I was better today. And there, his voice died in a whisper. I didn't strike you, muttered Kathy, chewing her lip to prevent another burst of emotion. He sighed and moaned like one under great suffering and kept it up for a quarter of an hour on purpose to distress his cousin, apparently, for whenever he caught a stifled sob from her, he put renewed pain and pathos into the inflections of his voice. I'm sorry I hurt you, Linton, she said at length, racked beyond endurance, but I couldn't have been hurt by that little push, and I had no idea that you could either. You're not much, are you, Linton? Don't let me go home thinking I've done you harm. Answer, speak to me. I can't speak to you, he murmured. You've hurt me so that I shall lie awake all night, choking with this cough. If you had it, you'd know what it was, but you'll be comfortably asleep while I'm in agony and nobody near me. I wonder how you would like to pass those fearful nights. And he began to wail aloud for very pity of himself. Since you are in the habit of passing dreadful nights, I said, it won't be Miss who spoils your ease. You'd be the same had she never come. However, she shall not disturb you again, and perhaps you'll get quieter when we leave you. Must I go? asked Catherine dolefully, bending over him. Do you want me to go, Linton? You can't alter what you've done, he replied pettishly, shrinking from her unless you alter it for the worse by teasing me into a fever. Well, then I must go, she repeated. Let me alone, at least, said he. I can't bear your talking. She lingered and resisted my persuasions to departure, a tiresome while. But as he neither looked up nor spoke, she finally made a movement to the door, and I followed. We were recalled by a scream. Linton had slid from his seat onto the hearthstone and lay writhing in the mere perverseness of an indulged plague of a child, determined to be as grievous and harassing as it can. I thoroughly gauged his disposition from his behavior and saw at once it would be folly to attempt humoring, humoring him. Not so, my companion. She ran back in terror, knelt down, and cried and soothed and entreated till he grew quiet from lack of breath by no means from compunction at distressing her. I shall lift him on the settle, I said, and he may roll about as he pleases. We can't stop to watch him. I hope you are satisfied, Miss Cathy, that you are not the person to benefit him and that his condition of health is not occasioned by attachment to you. Now then, there he is. Come away. As soon as he knows there is nobody by to care for his nonsense, he'll be glad to lie still. She placed a cushion under his head and offered him some water. He rejected the latter and tossed uneasily on the former, as if it were a stone or a block of wood. She tried to put it more comfortably. I can't do with that, he said. It's not high enough. Catherine brought another to lay above it. That's too high, murmured the provoking thing. How must I arrange it then, she asked despairingly. He twined himself up to her as she half knelt by the settle and converted her shoulder into a support. No, that won't do, I said. You'll be content with the cushion, Master Heathcliff. Miss has wasted too much time on you already. We cannot remain five minutes longer. Yes, yes we can, replied Cathy. He's good and patient now. He's beginning to think I shall have far greater misery than he will tonight, so I if I believe he is the worse for my visit. And then I dare not come again. Tell the truth about it, Linton, for I mustn't come if I have hurt you. You must come to cure me, he answered. You ought to come because you, because you have hurt me. You know you have, extremely. I was not as ill when you entered as I am at present, was I? But you've made yourself ill by crying and being in a passion. I didn't do it all, said his cousin. However, we'll be friends now and you want me. You would wish to see me sometimes, really? 
I told you I did, he replied impatiently. Sit on the settle and let me lean on your knee. That's as Mama used to do, whole afternoons together. Sit quite still and don't talk. But you may sing a song if you can sing, or you may say a nice, long, interesting ballad. One of those you promised to teach me, or a story. I'd rather have a ballad, though. Begin. Catherine repeated the longest she could remember. The employment pleased both mightily. Linton would have another, and after that, another, notwithstanding my strenuous objections. And so they went on until the clock struck twelve, and we heard Hareton in the court returning for his dinner. And tomorrow, Catherine, will you be here tomorrow? asked young Heathcliff, holding her frock as she rose reluctantly. No, I answered, nor next day neither. She, however, gave a different response, evidently, for his forehead cleared as she stooped and whispered in his ear. You won't go tomorrow, recollect, miss, I commenced when we were out of the house. You are not dreaming of it, are you? She smiled. Oh, I'll take good care, I continued. I'll have that lock mended, and you can escape by no way else. I can get over the wall, she said, laughing. The Grange is not a prison, Ellen, and you are not my jailer. And besides, I'm almost 17. I'm a woman, and I'm certain Linton would recover quickly if he had me to look after him. I'm older than he is, you know, and wiser. Less childish, am I not? And he'll soon do as I direct him with some slight coaxing. He's a pretty little darling when he's good. I'd make such a pet of him if he were mine. We should never quarrel, should we, after we were used to each other? Don't you like him, Ellen? Like him, I exclaimed. The worst tempered bit of a sickly slip that ever struggled into its teens. Happily, as Mr. Heathcliff conjectured, he'll not win twenty. I doubt whether he'll see spring indeed, and small loss to his family whenever he drops off. And lucky it is for us that his father took him. The kinder he was treated, the more tedious and selfish he'd be. I'm glad you have no chance of having him for a husband, Miss Catherine. My companion waxed serious at hearing the speech. To speak of his death so regardlessly wounded her feelings. He's younger than I, she answered, after a protracted pause of meditation, and he ought to live the longest. He will. He must live as long as I do. He's as strong now as when he first came into the North. I'm positive of that. It's only a cold that ails him, the same as Papa has. You say Papa will get better, and why shouldn't he? Well, well, I cried. After all, we needn't trouble ourselves. For listen, miss, and mind, I'll keep my word. If you attempt going to Wuthering Heights again, with or without me, I shall inform Mr. Linton, and unless you allow it, the intimacy with your cousin must not be revived. It has been revived, muttered Kathy sulkily. Must not be continued then, I said. We'll see, was her reply, and she set off at a gallop, leaving me to toil in the rear. We both reached home before our dinner time. My master supposed we had been wandering through the park, and therefore he demanded no explanation of our absence. As soon as I entered, I hastened to change my soaked shoes and stockings, but sitting such a while at the heights had done the mischief. On the succeeding morning, I was laid up, and during three weeks, I remained incapacitated for attending to my duties. A calamity never experienced prior to that period, and never, I am thankful to say, since. My little mistress behaved like an angel in coming to wait on me and cheer my solitude. The confinement brought me exceedingly low. It is wearisome to a stirring active body, but few have slighter, but few have slighter reasons for complaint than I had. The moment Catherine left Mr. Linton's room, she appeared at my bedside. Her day was divided between us. No amusement usurped a minute. She neglected her meals, her studies, and her play, and she was the fondest nurse that ever watched. She must have had a warm heart when she loved her father so, to give so much to me. I said her days were divided between us, but the master retired early, and I generally needed nothing after six o'clock. Thus the evening was her own. Poor thing. I never considered what she did with herself after tea. And though frequently when she looked in to bid me good night, I remarked a fresh color in her cheeks and a pinkness over her slender fingers, instead of fancying the hue borrowed from a cold ride across the moors, I laid it to the charge of a hot fire in the library. 
That concludes today's reading. I'm hoping that we'll find out tomorrow what Kathy slash Catherine Linton has been doing with her time. Hmm? With her father and both Ellen Dean resting and recuperating from illness. <sighs> what has she been up to? We'll find out today or in tomorrow's reading of Weathering Heights by Emily Bronte. Oh, we have... Oh, not even a hundred pages yet to go. Oh, it's so exciting. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow. I uh, know. Hmm. Suspicious goings on out there at Weathering Heights and Thrush Cross Grange. We'll see what happens tomorrow in our continued reading of Weathering Heights by Emily Bronte. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope to see you tomorrow for more book. Bye.